Hi, my name is Joel Leder, and I will be discussing semiotic structural analysis. First, what is semiotic structural analysis? If we break down this term into its components, we see that semiotics is the study of signs, sign systems, and their meanings where, when a sign is anything from which meaning might be generated. So this would include words, images, sounds, gestures, objects, etc. Structuralism in this context would say that signs have a limited range of meanings, each of which can be identified. So semiotic structural methods seek to determine the meaning of signs and sign systems. Signs are made up of two components. The signifier uh, refers to the form in which the sign is communicated. So this might be an image, spoken or written word, and the signified is the concept that is being communicated. So in this example that you see here, the signifier would be the red light, which signifies, the, and the signified would be to stop. So we take the physical object of the red light and we associate some sort of meaning, commonly accepted meaning, to that uh, signifier. When determining the significance of signs and their meanings, however, it is important to consider context. The sign mouse could have very different meanings depending on the context in which it is used. Because signs are everywhere, a semiotic, analy a semiotic analysis uh, can be performed on just about any type of qualitative data such as written text, speech, videos, or images. Regardless of the form the data take, it is the task of the analyst to pull apart the signs and their symbolism and determine the overall meaning. Given that uh, given stated that semiotics is more than just identifying signs and ascribing meanings to them, the approach is more about how these signs and meanings relate to each other uh, and as uh, how they relate to other things as well as ideas. That relationship helps us to better determine how signs impact the way in which we view the world. Semiotics is a form of social constructivist thinking. Constructivists assert uh, that individuals develop or construct meanings that are subjective based on their own experiences. This means that those meanings vary among individuals, thus requiring the researcher to look for patterns and see complex perspectives that others have about reality. As with all approaches, there are strengths and weaknesses associated with semiotic analysis. The semiotic metho methodology helps to clarify broad cu cultural values. If a sign is interpreted the same among a wide group of people, we can logically infer that it that it and its meaning have some sort of larger cultural significance. Also, semiotics pushes researchers to examine how signs and their meanings are not fixed, meaning they can change over time in a different context, nor are they universally understood by those outside of the culture. So going back to our mouse example, um, 50 years ago, the word mouse would not have uh, the meaning associated with um, a part of a computer, for example. Um, because that context has changed. Weaknesses of this methodology include that the view, uh, it's, uh, some view it as being too theoretical or too speculative or too subjective. There are uh, also, there does not seem to be a, any standardized procedure or process for conducting such an analysis. So this means that the researchers need to be very detailed and explicit about the analysis procedures they undertake when using semiotics. So now that I've explained some of the details associated with the approach, let's look at it in action. First, as stated before, there is no agreed upon set of steps in conducting this type of analysis. I'm going to use a three-step procedure uh, recommended by Chandler to analyze the familiar nursery rhyme, I'm a little teapot. So here's the text of the familiar nursery rhyme. 
if you're like me, you've repeated these lines countless times without really examining the potential meaning of the rhyme. If we look more closely at the signs, in this example, the words that are used and the meanings they evoke, we can see it through a deeper, different lens. So the first step in Chandler's process is to identify the signs and question their meanings. Here I put a red box around the signs that I've selected for a deeper analysis. In the table on the right side, you can see that the meanings I've associated with these signs. Some are quite literal, for example, stout meaning round or fat. This would be called the denotation of that word, the, the actual, uh, if you want to think, dictionary definition of that word. Uh, whereas some are much more abstract, like teapot representing fragility. Also, as stated before, context is important. Look at the word handle in line 3. Depending on how one uses this word, handle can be a noun, meaning something that can be grabbed, like the handle of a cabinet, or it can be, or it can be a verb, meaning to deal with. Also important, note that this step, uh, note in this, excuse me, another important note in this step is about phrases. If you look at the last line, the phrases tip me over and pour me out have complex meanings. It's the job of the researcher to consider what these phrases might mean in context, uh, in the context in which they are used, as well as approaching the signs from multiple perspectives to help consider their meanings. The second step is to consider the structural relationships both within the text and between the text and the broader world. We know that I'm a little teapot uh, is a familiar and popular children's nursery rhyme, but thinking a little bit more deeply about some of the text's larger cultural significance leads us to understand that tea is often associated with calming and relaxing, that having tea can be a formal social event, and that children don't often drink tea. However, it is common for them to pretend to do so during tea parties. If we look a little bit more closely at the structure of the text, we see in lines 1 through 4, uh, there's a focus on physical description. Whereas in lines 5 and 6, uh, there's an emphasis on sound imagery. All of this should be considered when constructing meaning from the text. The final step is, determine, is to determine the realities or larger meanings associated with the signs. For example, the signs themselves, uh, I'm sorry, after examining the signs themselves, then looking at the relationship the text has with a broader perspective, we can conclude that this rhyme is a metaphor for teaching children how to deal with anger. Children, like teapots, are fragile and should be handled carefully. When teapots are heated, they begin to make a loud noise. Heated could also mean to become upset or angry, and just like teapots, Children can begin to shout or scream when they become frustrated. Tipping over suggests moving or repositioning something, and pouring out suggests emptying. So this nursery rhyme could be advising two courses of action when dealing with an angry child. Remove them from the situation, or allow them to pour out their feelings. Finally, if we, can, if we consider that I'm a little teapot is commonly taught to and repeated by children, we can see that it is more than a simple nursery rhyme. It's a moral lesson for children to, uh, for children, and how to recognize the signs of anger and deal with those feelings appropriately.